the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When He is King, all wars will cease. May His peace begin with me. Gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my sword into a plow. Into a plow. Gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my into a plow, into a plow. Gonna, gonna beat my sword into a plow. Christ is king in my life now. May his peace begin with me. Cross Keys Village, the Brethren Home community of New Oxford, Pennsylvania, had its roots established over 100 years ago. Today, it's the home of over 1,100 residents who live in various types of housing on its 300 acres of land. Brethren Voices has featured several of the 22 Brethren Homes on our programs in the past. Hello, I'm Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. Cross Keys is a retirement village that has a lot happening all of the time. Every season is filled with countless choices, courses, classes, exercise trips, groups, art, crafts, music, gardening, worship, and more volunteer opportunities than many other retirement communities. Folks are offered an impressive range of accommodations from cozy cottages and sunny apartments to impressive single-family country homes. The new Bridgewater expansion is carefully designed for retirees who wish to establish and experience senior living without downsizing. It's downright incredible what they have done at Cross Keys Village over the years. In 1981, a stamp club was started. They are simply known as the Stampers. These residents of Cross Keys Village get together two days each week and process canceled stamps that they receive in packets like this from all over the country and beyond. They process these canceled stamps and sell them to a New York stamp dealer to earn money to fund various programs around Cross Keys Village. Welcome to the Volunteer Stamp Program. My name is Dwight Mon. I'm one of the many volunteers in the program. I'm a retired school teacher here from New Oxford. I live in the borough of New Oxford. I'm not a resident. And uh, so I retired 10 years ago from teaching and uh, folks got me involved in the program. As far as the program itself, it began in 1981. It was designed for activity purposes for the residents to become involved in active manual dexterity uh, as well as brain function and being, uh, being uh, active in those areas. Uh, what we do basically is we take all the stamps that we can possibly get. We get them from all over the world, literally all over the world. Uh, they come in bags, as we have here in front of us. They come in boxes. Uh, they come in cards and letters, uh, anywhere from one stamp to thousands. And what we do is we process the stamps and pack them, and then we resell them to um, stamp dealers in New York, actually a subsidiary of Mystic Stamp Company. It's called Ben Art. And uh, we ship probably four or five times a year. And each pack that we use is, looks like this. That's all the larger it is. That contains a hundred stamps of the same, exact same design. And it has a Scott number, which is how we identify it. So we ship four trays of that. And the money that we get from it it goes into a separate fund and periodically then we approach the different departments here at the home, ask them what they might need above and beyond budget 
and they'll come in and give us a little presentation of what they want, why they need it, why it's important, and then the volunteers here that do the work get to vote upon which item, what they'd like to spend their money on. So over the years, since 1981, we've uh, bought approximately $100,000 worth of equipment, anywhere from uh, wheelchairs to defibrillators, uh, washing machine, dryer, you name it. We, we've bought it on almost everything possible. So the first thing we do is to sort into two piles, basically. Stamps that get soaked off paper, stamps that stay on paper. It used to be all the stamps ever printed were soaked off, you could soak them off paper. But in the last 10 years or so, they've got more of these self-adhesives that everybody, everybody loves so well. They're great for people using them, but most of them will not soak off the paper. There's a special adhesive on it, and uh, they simply will not soak off very well. So the company that we deal with, they said, leave them on paper. I'm Mary Hartz, and I'm sorting stamps. Stamps that they had to cut off. Some people sort the stamps that have been soaked off and dried and in a, another category, but these do not soak because of the paste or the glue they used on them. They, would, they just don't soak off. So then they had to, we had to cut them. And they have to be cut perfectly without damaging the perforation around them. If they damage that, or it's torn in any way, we cannot use it. I heard of the stamp program when we moved here 12 and a half years ago, and I didn't join right away, but I guess I've been doing it for eight or eight or nine years anyway. I used to soak, and then <laughs> they wanted me to learn the different things there because they needed people to sort, so I learned that. And right now I'm, I'm sorting Things like here's all the same kind of uh, flags, all four different kind, and now I'm sorting flowers. Then they're put in the boxes over there, and then uh, the different ladies package them, 100 to a pack, get them ready to send out. You might have four stamps that are they look exactly alike, and yet they're different. And we have different people that are we've trained to do different things. Like one of the things are the perforations, the little zigzag things around the stamp. Uh, the, f the one you're probably your most familiar with now is this, the uh, spring, summer, fall, winter stamp. The flag stamps that are out right now, they've been out for now for about two years. They come in coils and booklets. Now, a coil, straight edge top and bottom, and the perforations are just down the sides. But there are three different perforations. There's a real tiny perf, there's a middle-sized perf, and there's a big perf. They have to be sorted by perforations. Also, same design, there are two different booklets printed by two, two different printing companies. They have micro printing somewhere on the stamp that you need a magnifying glass to identify it and it's in different locations. The one uh, company puts them on the flagpole. The other company puts it somewhere else on the stamp. You have to separate those two as well because they are considered different stamps, even though the design looks exactly the same. So there's five right now that on those, and you've got four designs, so there's 20 possibilities that you could have. I enjoy working with the stamps very much. I love seeing all the different ones. They're all different and all the colors. Uh, and I wonder where they came from and where they're going and uh, who, who gets them. But the biggest thing is, is that I, amazes me is that um, the amount of money that we receive uh, for the stamps and the things that we buy. Uh, for the community here. It's just amazing what all this turns out to be. The value that we get is anywhere from five cents a hundred to ten dollars a hundred. Now the five centers are like some of the Christmas stamps, the very common ones. The uh, uh, 
years ago, the, the, the we call it the presidential series, 1938 series that started at one half cent and went all the way to five dollars. Most of those are very, very common. We get five cents a hundred for that type of stamp. And they range upwards to 10 cents, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50, 60, all the way up to $10 ones. Now the $10 packet is a hundred of things like build a nation stamps, those black and white ones that came out about a year or so ago. There's 15 of them to a sheet and all different designs. So it takes a long time to get a hundred of each one. You can't, when we ship them, we can't mix them. It's got to be a hundred of each separate stamp. So that takes a while and that's why we get the bigger value. In general, commemoratives, the larger stamps, bring the most money. They run usually anywhere from about 50 cents to a dollar. One of the things that we were able to purchase is the van that takes people from uh, in the community here. Uh, we purchased that and this past year we purchased um, a dryer, uh, for a big commercial dryer for the laundry and a fibrillators for all the floors. Uh, this year there was only one floor that was missing and that we purchased that one for this year and that was the first floor. It is amazing what, our, what these little stamps will do for our community. For Cross Keys Village, volunteers are so important for the ministry. As there are over 1,100 residents, there are almost as many volunteers. One thing I'm not sure about is are the dogs involved in their therapy program considered volunteers? Regardless, the dogs provide many hours of contact with residents requiring more intensive care. My name is Pam Miller and I'm a retired teacher uh, and when I retired from teaching I needed something to uh, fill my time and my second love from children was uh, dogs and I had a wonderful uh, lab that um, was born with just a very loving personality and always knew she'd make a wonderful therapy dog so we um, I became, we became a certified therapy team through K-PETS, the K-PETS organization based in Lancaster. And since then we've visited um, nursing homes and I spent a lot of time in schools and colleges. We love um, visiting, especially the residents in the Brethren home here. Um, they're just, they're always so happy to see her and just full of love and she, she really, you can really tell she picks out her favorites that she remembers and she, when she sees them, she's very eager to, to see them and, and say hi to them and get their love and their hugs and um, even though they don't remember her name and it's almost like the first time she's coming um, and visiting them she remembers them and they still love her as much um, as she loves them so it's very rewarding you know i always tell people it's almost like when you're little and you have a stuffed animal and you're having a bad day you know you always hug that stuffed animal you as a child would cuddle up with your animal well a dog is the same thing and a therapy dog just has a big heart and any dog any animal could become a, a therapy animal um, it's just that instinct they have um, to let you love them and cuddle them and hug them and um, they, it just makes you feel good inside. And walking around here today, it was just fun watching her see the Santa Clauses and the trees, and she gets all excited just like a child would. She went to check everything out because it was new to her, and, and um, so they're, they're a lot like children. <laughs> Bogey uh, started to come to work at five months old. He just turned five in September, and I had asked the administrator here, Julie Hall, if um, I could bring Bogey in as a pet therapy. So Bogey and I went through all the classes and all the certifications to 
be able to come to work and he has now come to work Monday through Friday um, every day for the last four and a half years so he has become a a staple here in personal care actually bogey gets depressed if he doesn't get to come to work <laughs> he has 87 of his closest friends right here who spoil him every day and have treats for him and spend time with him he goes to residence doors to go in and he'll knock on the door and push the door open and come in to visit um, he loves if you have a sofa or a snack and he actually picks favorite people here which is amazing I just watch him do it he gets very close to people and tends to want to go back and visit them more often Luke is one of three dogs that I have that do pet therapy Luke was my first therapy dog um, I actually knew I wanted to do pet therapy before I got Luke as a puppy and so I talked to his breeder and said I really want a dog with a temperament that would be good to do this kind of work. And um, so we waited and didn't get him until he was four months old so that they could really get a good idea of his temperament. And um, so we brought him home and he's been an old soul and <laughs> he never was a rambunctious pup. He was the perfect dog for pet therapy. Just about any breed of dog can be a good therapy dog, but temperament is really the important thing. They have to be very calm in all situations. We came in for our interview here to start doing pet therapy, and the fire alarm went off, and Luke just sat there. And the girl that was interviewing us said, that's amazing, why didn't he jump? Why didn't that scare him? And I said, that's part of what we train them for. But they must start with an, uh, good temperament and then from there basic obedience skills and um, just socializing them everywhere we possibly can we take them to places like tractor supply we take them to Home Depot and Lowe's places where uh, shopping carts are being pushed around that sort of simulates a person walking with a walker um, Doors are opening automatically. Sounds are very different from what they encounter at home. So we expose them as early as we can to a variety of different stimuluses. And from there, um, they become very comfortable with those kinds of things. And they learn to trust us. What happens sometimes is the dog will show a little fear of something new or an, an unusual, but we teach them when that happens to look at us and we say that's okay and give them a treat and they learn that they can trust us to take care of them no matter what's happening around them. Buddy, <laughs> Luke knows. You have pretty eyes. He does. He does, doesn't he? Oh, <laughs> it just gets to you. Yes. Yeah. And you're all dressed up. Yeah. They always dress up to see Miss Alice. Yes. Right. But I don't yes. dress up what have I Oh, you look beautiful. Uh, they develop a relationship, and we develop a relationship with the residents. Um, we've had residents who inevitably we've lost, and who we've gone to, to their um, funerals. Um, we had met the family during visits. Uh, we don't do that with everyone, but there are some that become special. You develop a relationship that's almost like they're part of your family. We really enjoy doing what we do because we know um, we can walk into a room where someone's sitting very sad and they see the dogs and they smile. And the smile begins to uh, develop into um, they're wanting to talk and, uh, and just raising their spirits in general so that when we leave the room, um, they're feeling better than when they were when we came in. One of the fundraising events at Cross Keys Village each year for over the last 30 years has been the Apple Butter Festival. Each October, members of the Rep Logo family still make apple butter the old-fashioned way, boiled in a huge copper pot over an open fire. The apples are donated 
and volunteers to the preparation of the apples. And the festival is held with folks enjoying fun family activities. Music, baked goods, and good food. The great apple butter is for sale along with baked goods and more. We've been friends of the brother and home now for many, many years. And this is our 31st annual apple butter boil here at the brother and home. And uh, in the last number of years, it has really grown into a, a much larger event with the fall festival and, and a lot of other activities tagged along our apple butter boil. What started out with my mother um, I'm not quite sure how it came about, but it was her idea to produce a kettle of apple butter to allow the residents to come out, visit with each other, reminisce about their childhood and their days making apple butter themselves on the farm or whatever. And this this project has grown and um, this is the second, I'm the second generation. Uh, my daughter is very much involved and uh, uh, we're just having a, you know, a great time doing this once a year. Uh, the recipe that we use is, um, it, it, it was a family, that's a family heirloom. It came with the original kettle that we have. Um, which I understand was a wedding gift to my grandparents whenever they were married. Have no idea how old the kettle was before that, but it was used. And um, what we do, you start with the kettle clear full of, of apple cider, and the sweeter the better, and then you boil that um, halfway. So you reduce the cider to halfway on the kettle, and that's the signal to start adding apples. Now, our original kettle was an 18 gallon, and that takes two and a half bushels of apples, um, peeled, cored, and sliced fine. And we always use a cooking apple so that they they cook up the original recipe called for winter banana, which is a very hard apple to get anymore, but Golden Delicious um, is a real good sweet cooking apple. And so whenever you get the cider down halfway, then you start adding the apples and um, that's when you start to stir. Before that, you don't have to do anything but just watch it boil. and. Um, and then once you start adding apples, then you have to continually stir till it's finished. Uh, on a good day, it usually takes around eight hours from start to finish. There's a, an official um, test to, uh, to test that, and that's to put a blob on a, on a plate, and you, you strike a line through it, and you look for weep, uh, liquid weeping into that, that line you've drawn. If you don't get any weep, and then you're able to turn the plate upside down and it not drip off, that's whenever you have the right consistency. Now it's time to add sugar. And that is to taste. So it depends on how sweet your cider is, how sweet your apples are, um, how much 
sugar you have to add, and that's to taste. Some like it, you know, really sweet, and some not. So, generally, after you put a put your your um, your sugar in, then it's usually an hour after that. You've got to boil that liquid that you've just created. You've got to boil that off, and whenever you get it back to the right consistency, then you add the oils. And we add sassafras, cinnamon, and clove. And we use a, it's a little uh, spice oil, and we add the drops of that, get a good mix on it, and then it's ready to jar. It was always done before with a funnel and a scoop, and um, always had a lot of trouble um, judging how much to pour in the funnel and not overfill the jar. And I had been thinking about this for a number of years, and last year um, I finally got a plan in my head as to what I wanted. I talked to a sheet metal man, and I have, we have manufactured a jarring system that uh, really works great. And it has a large volume on top that I can keep scooping into. And it has a, a slide valve at the bottom. And somebody can bring the jars in. You pull the slide open. And it's very precise. Slide the jar aside. Somebody's putting caps on. And it just speeded that process up wonderfully. And uh, that's been a great addition to our, our, uh, our manufacturing process. The Brethren have done such a great job providing retirement living opportunities around the country. Often heard, we should have come here years ago. Well, now you have seen a few of the things that make living at Cross Keys Village something special. This is Brent Carlson for Brethren Voices, wishing you peace. All those who tread, all those who tread, the path he trod, the path he trod, all those who tread, all those who tread, the path he trod, the path he trod, all those who tread, the path he trod, shall be called the friends of God. May his peace begin with me. Oh, the Jesus way, oh, the Jesus way, is the way of peace, is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way, oh, the Jesus way, is the way of peace, is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When he is king, all wars will cease. May his peace begin with